For those of you who just walked in, welcome to Lecture 15. And uh, today um, uh, we're going to do some uh, stuff uh, continuing on our discussion of this Wainwright and, Jor and Jordan book. Um, actually, you should be more than you should you should be have finished Chapter Four by now. And also to remind you that you do have a, an assignment, an updated project proposal due, which I've already talked about. Um, Friday morning, November 1st, at 9 a.m. p.m. <laughs> what does that mean? 9 a.m. That can be interpreted as either and or or. Right. OK, so today we're going to talk about, uh, sort of do a little bit of review of hypergraphs, partially ordered sets, the Möbius inversion lemma, and inclusion exclusion, and how it relates to the Kikuchi approximation. Um, or the Kahuchi, I should say, class of approximations, since it's not just one approximation. So just to remind you where we are, so we have this dual of the dual representation of the log partition function. And we've seen this now for a couple of lectures. And as, as I've said, essentially this gives us a vehicle of many, many different approximations right away. This is sort of our, our framework within which we're working. And again, what we're doing is we're either approximating <laughs> the um, mean parameters, which in the case of a discrete um, graphical model can be represented as a polytope. And in some cases, in the overcomplete case, it's called the marginal polytope. And also the dual, which we saw to be the negative entropy. And so we have two different strategies, two different things we want to approximate to make computing this thing tractable. And one way we saw was by assuming a tree form. And when it's a tree, uh, when, the, when a tree distribution is, is, uh, is the true distribution, then, then we get the exact, we get essentially an expression for a polytope, which is easy to deal with when it's a tree, and also an entropy, which is easy to deal with when it's a tree. But then we just say, okay, well, what if it's not a tree? Just sort of do the same thing. The, the marginal polytope is, is um, expanded to the local consistency polytope, which are the constraints that are sufficient to ensure that we've got real marginals when it is a tree, and we're just going to use those same constraints even when it's not a tree, which is going to be fewer constraints than necessary, and it's going to be a simplified polytope, much easier to deal with and much easier to optimize over. Uh, and if we, had only done, if we only did that, then since we're taking the, su the supremum over a larger polytope, we're going to get an upper bound. But where we, we lose the fact that it's a bound is, is in the entropy approximation, because we've got an expression for the entropy in the case of a tree, which and that form, that mathematical form of the entropy, we're just going to assume and use even when the graph is not a tree. And, that, and that's going to give us this form down here. So this is the entropy when it's a, uh, the entropy, the mathematical form of the entropy when it's a tree, used when it's even a not, when it's not a tree. And we've got the local consistency polytope. OK, any questions about that, that general approach? OK, so it's all about approximation. The second thing we saw was the loop series expansion, which is essentially a way of, of doing a correction factor. So when it's not a tree, uh, when it is a tree, then we have equality. And this whole thing here ends up just being 0. But when it's not a tree, that is exactly the difference between the true log partition and the beta approximation. And this is not something, this meaning this, is not something that we can, we can compute efficiently, but it might be something we can reasonably approximate. Because, for example, we have this sum over subsets of edges, 
which, as we argued last time, is something such that any subset of edges which is not a generalized loop gets uh, killed off because of one of at least one of the terms, one of the factors in the product ends up being zero. Um, so we end up getting essentially the set of all generalized loops. And so this gives us a way of approximating um, the, uh, this term, the green term, by using only some of the loops. And that might be a nice strategy, because if we only have a small number of loops, then there aren't that many terms. And maybe, we, maybe that can get us the majority of the way between the beta approximation and the true log partition function. Okay. Any questions on that? OK, so then the general idea of the Kikuchi class of approximations. So this is not just one approximation. So in, the, in the case of the beta approximation, there's, it's really one approximation, although I guess there could be different trees we use. But it's really just one sort of method in the sense that we're assuming a tree. In the case of the Kikuchi approximation, we have, or the Kukuki class of approximation, we can, rather than just using trees, using uh, hyper, hyper trees, and then come up with an expression both for the polytope and for the entropy in the case of a hyper tree, and then use that mathematical expression for a hypergraph, <coughs> even when the hypergraph is not a hyper tree. So, very much like in the beta approximation, in the case of a hyper tree, it will be exact. If it's a junction tree cover of the original graph, it will be exact, but then also intractable. But what we can do is then have it be a hyper tree, which is not a junction tree cover. And it won't be exact, um, but it still will give us a strategy that is more powerful than just assuming it's a, it's a one tree. Uh, and that's basically the idea. So the overall approach, as we outlined last time, and like I said, there'll be a little bit of redundancy with last time. There'll be a lot, of, a lot of redundancy with last time, not just a little bit of redundancy. So the overall approach is to, first of all, derive an expression for the entropy associated with a hypertree or a junction tree. Then next, generalize this expression for any hypergraph. Okay. Then third, consider the local consistency properties for a hypertree or junction tree, right? Remember, in the case of a junction tree, we said that local consistency implies global consistency. And because it's a junction tree, and which, is a, which is an edge clique cover of the original graph, that actually gives us an exact expression. But when it's not an edge clique cover, when it's not a junction, when it's not an actual junction tree cover of the original graph, um, it's not. But what we can do, however, is like get the expression in the form of a junction tree, like might, which might be in terms of, say, these cliques, or what we're going to see are going to be hyperedges. And then we, def we use the same consistency property, but for any hypergraph, for a hypergraph that we've constructed, uh, which uh, isn't necessarily a tree. Yep? So will this be hopefully more accurate, but take longer to compute than the graph? It will definitely take longer th th to compute, <laughs> because it's not going to be a one tree. Um, but in general, like you, if it's a, you know, you could say that a k tree is exponential in k. So in general, this is going to be exponential in k, where k is the k tree into which the hypertree can be embedded. Um, but just because it's exponential in k doesn't mean it's n it's not possible to do. I mean, if r is binary and k is three, that's not a big deal. So you set the k to be as large as you're willing to spend time computing, right? And from the perspective of the model, I mean, k is like a constant. So you know, as if, if k is fixed and n is growing, it's still k is a constant. So it's still polynomial in n, because k is a constant. So it's not like k is growing. Um, but in general, yeah, I mean, you're perfectly happy using larger cliques, as long as the clique size don't grow un, you know, unboundedly, in which case, because it's exponential in the clique size, exponential in k. Um, so yeah, but yes, it will be slower. Now, unfortunately, in the general case, we don't know uh, if it's going to be more accurate. But what we do know, we have a very similar result to what we saw in the case of a tree, which is that when we're going to form this Lagrangian uh, optimization, 
And we're not going to go through the algebra, but what we're going to sort of see, and we're going to look at the expressions that lead to that algebra, is that the fixed point of this Lagrangian expression is equal to the, th to the convergence point of a, f of a generalized belief propagation strategy on a hypergraph. And the analogy, th the way that we can, f we can do belief propagation on a hypergraph is exactly analogous to loopy belief propagation. But we'll, we'll see that when we get to the end of the, today's lecture. Okay. So, um, OK, so this is called the clustered variational approximation. And there's a lots of different ways of doing this. I mean, there's not just one paper. There's not just one method. There are different special cases. There's different ways of forming the clusters, different ways of forming the hypergraphs, uh, all of which uh, lead you to any, any strategy. So for your type of graph, you might have a particular type of clustering which is good, or which you might find empirically to be good, and you might not know why. Um, but it's still, it's, it's, it's a nice strategy. And also, by the way, if, if it's the case that this ends up being a hyper tree, which is a junction tree cover of the original graph, then we've recovered the original exact inference algorithm of the junction tree algorithm that we spent the first you know, half of the quarter doing. So this is a very general and very powerful method because it allows us to span between the exact junction tree method, which we know, the beta free energy, and everything in between via this hypergraph. So what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about now is just to get a better sense of, of this, because I don't think uh, we covered it uh, properly last lecture, is, is hypergraphs, partially ordered sets, inclusion, inclu exclusion, and uh, the Möbius inversion lemma, and how all these things relate in, in order to find us the the Kikuchi approximation. So this is what the goal is for today. So like I said, this is redundant with the last time. I'm, not, I, and I, I'm being redundant by saying it's redundant, so I'm not going to any longer say it's redundant. So just expect it to be redundant. Okay. So we've got a graph. Um, and a graph, we said, can be s represented as a set of nodes and a set of edges, where a set of edges is a pair of vertices. Right? Every edge can be seen just as a pair of nodes. And there's nothing really special about an edge. And a hypergraph is a generalization of a graph where every hyper edge or every edge in a hypergraph can be one or two or three or more vertices. And so each edge, we're still using the same notation here, each edge E is just some subset of the vertices. Okay? And, and it's not necessarily required to be two. So in some sense, a hypergraph can be seen as a set system, which is basically a set and a set of subsets. Any set system is a set and a set of subsets. Any graph is a set, set, set system, a set and a set of subsets. In a hypergraph, the set of subsets uh, are such that any one of these subsets can be any set of nodes. So like here is an edge E, and E basically consists of some number of vertices, k sub E vertices. And uh, again, in a graph, in a regular graph, the size of each edge is 2. And so therefore, any graph is a hypergraph, but not vice versa. OK, so how do we draw hypergraphs? So we know that when we have a graph, like here, here's a set of nodes. This is, this is a graph, right? This is a graph with no edges. So in any graph, it's sufficient, because every, every edge consists of a set of nodes, it's just sufficient to connect the corresponding pairs. So we could actually just write edges here, and so on and so forth. And that would be a graph, right? So um, the, set, the set of subsets are indicated by the edges. And that's, that's all a graph is doing. With a hypergraph, however, it's not clear that how to do this. Because like, the question is, if you take, for example, this three nodes, this, this set of three nodes, is that three distinct edges? Or is that one edge of set three? So using a graph by itself, a regular graph, is not sufficient to, 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 to specify a hypergraph. Very similar. And this is very similar to what happens in a Markov random field, where a Markov random field is a regular <coughs> graph. And in a Markov random field, when you have that set of three nodes, you don't know if there's one factor 
which involves all three of those nodes and, and all three of those variables directly interact. Or it, you don't, or it could be that there's three factors, each factor of which involves only two out of the three nodes in that set of three nodes. So a graph is deficient in the same sense as a mark of random field is deficient, in the sense that it doesn't really give you the full factorization. This is why a factor graph is used in those cases. And this is why I've been saying before, a factor graph is a hypergraph. So let's make this more precise. So in a hypergraph, I don't know if you can see this. Hopefully you can. Maybe if I turn off a little bit more of the lights. Is this a little bit more viewable? In a hypergraph, you'll see it on, on YouTube without problem, I think. Uh, it looks good on the screen. Or I can, I can show you this case here. There you go. Uh, if basically you have to designate a set of nodes. So one way of doing it is to, for example, shade in the edges. So for example, one edge is represented by this green set, right? Another edge is represented by this yellow set. And another edge is represented by this red set and so on. And there's another edge here, which I'm not sure you can see. I might as well circle all the edges. So these are all of the edges, I think. And notice that we have one edge, which is a subset of another edge. So ej is an edge. That's actually the original edge, but that's a subset of the edge dkej. So that's a hypergraph. Yep. Why do we bother calling them edges instead of just like a set of range or something like that? Well, because. <coughs> um, That's a good question. That's, that's a linguistic, lexicographic question, I think. And I don't know why edges are called edges in a graph, to be honest. Like, why should we call them edges? Maybe because of um, the fact that if you think of um, sort of a polytope, it's kind of like an edge of a polytope. I don't know. That's, that's, that I'm not sure about. But I know that the terminology in a hypergraph being an edge is just a generalization, because they serve the same function. They're subsets of vertices. There are directed hypergraphs. There are, and interestingly started enough. Three years. Yeah, there, th we're, we'll see a couple of examples of things. Like, like you might wonder, like, what is a path in a hypergraph? We'll, we'll see that in a minute. There's a whole, there's a great text, by the way, by, uh, I think his name is Claude Berge a famous French mathematician who wrote a text on hypergraphs, which is a fantastic text if you're interested in learning more about hypergraphs. There's also, um, in uh, the book mentions this book uh, by Stanley, uh, Richard Stanley, who's a mathematician, I believe, at MIT, who wrote two amazing texts called Enumerative Combinatorics, which talks a bunch about hypergraphs. Um, but the origin of the terminology, I'm not sure about. That's a good question. Yep. Um, so a directed hypergraph, I mean, uh, you, you don't have to go, go into this in too much depth, but a directed hypergraph, is that uh, with each of the I don't think we should. I think we have a lot to cover, so let's let's push forward on that. OK, so there's there's plenty of stuff. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff. We're going to, I really want to finish the stuff in today's lecture. But but so if you have a directed hypergraph, let's talk about it after uh, off, offline. OK, so um, so so. One thing that we can do, as we saw before, was that hypergraphs can be represented by bipartite graphs. And bipartite graphs are the graphs that are used to represent factor graphs. A factor graph graph is a, hyper, is a bipartite graph, which therefore is a hypergraph. And in a hypergraph, we have two sets of nodes, the left set of nodes, V, and the right set of nodes, F. You can think of the right set of nodes as maybe features, even. And E becomes the set of edges in the, hyper, in the, in the bipartite graph are meant only to connect the hyper edges to the, to the vertices. So they're still regular edges, but it, you're using the graph in a very different way. So here's, here's a um, hypergraph representation. Here's a bipartite graph representation of the hypergraph on the left. So let's, um, the colors are supposed to meant convey the same thing. So this guy here, This edge here is number one, which is this guy. 
Okay. Uh, this one down here. Whoops, not that. I don't want to do that. This one down here is this guy down here. And then similarly, this one is this one here. And so on and so forth. OK, so um, is everybody clear on that? Okay. Now, it's still not clear like what would a path be and that kind of stuff. And what is the uh, what does a conformality mean? And what is an acyclic graph? Because like what what we really care about are hypergraphs that are acyclic. So in a regular graph, it makes sense to talk about an acyclic graph, which is basically a tree. Any any graph that doesn't have a cycle, an acyclic graph is going to be a tree. But what is an acyclic hypergraph? Because as soon as you have an edge with more than two vertices in it, you can say, OK, well, there's, in some sense, an original. If you look at, essentially, these three nodes connected together, that would form a cycle if you were thinking of it as a regular graph. But again, that corresponds to the deficiency of the regular graph representation in that it doesn't convey um, uh, the, what the hypergraph does convey. So let's give us a hypergraph. So the graph of a hypergraph, this is an actual term, the graph of a hypergraph, and we're using the notation g of h, is a graph, g of h, where we have the same set of vertices and a new set of edges, e prime, where e prime are, are simple edges. These are, these are just basically vertex pairs. And then what we say, the graph of the hypergraph is a graph such that there's an edge in E prime for every pair of nodes that are in the same hyperedge. So that basically means that if you are two nodes in the hypergraph that live in the same hyperedge, if there's any hyperedge which contains you, that means those, there's going to be an edge in the graph of that hypergraph. So that kind of is sort of an obvious thing. Um, this, I think I have a picture of this. Uh, no, I think I have a mistake of this. I'm sorry. <coughs> I think no. I, I think this picture is supposed to show that. But anyway, let let me um. I'll just fill it in. So if you go back to this picture, the graph of this hypergraph would be to add an edge. So that that's an edge, right? These things are edges. This is these are edges because basically what there has to so it's basically turning every hyperedge into a clique. And uh, this one might be a little bit tr tricky. I'm probably going to forget some edges here. And that's also this one. I'm sure I forgot some edges, but basically every hyperedge turns into a clique of origin of sort of pairwise edges in the graph of the hypergraph. So everybody get the idea? OK. OK, so a, a hypergraph is said to be conformal. This is sort of an interesting property. A, a gra hypergraph is said to be conformal. And it's conformal just by definition to its, to its graph, to the hypergraph's graph. If every clique of um, g of the, of the graph of the hypergraph is contained in an edge of h. Okay. So um, now here's the um, the definition of a acyclic hypergraph. A hypergraph h is acyclic is if h is conformal and the graph of the hypergraph is triangulated. So acyclic hypergraphs are the same exact criterion as the graph of that hypergraph being chordal. And as we know, as we've seen before, triangulated graphs are like trees, right? We've seen 
these are also perfect elimination order graphs. These are also graphs that have the induced subtree property. These are also, when we look at the, the intersection graphs, which are, which are intersections of subsets of some tree, these are, I think at this point, we have a very strong intuition in how triangulated graphs relate to trees. And so therefore, hyper, hyper, acyclic hypergraphs are basically just triangulated graphs. OK, so a hypergraph is called reduced if no edge is a subset of another edge. So for example, on the left-hand side, we see a non-reduced hypergraph because this edge here, ej, is a subset of, the, of this other edge, um, dk, ej. So we have this subset relationship. On the right-hand side, the hypergraph is reduced because no hyperedge is a subset of any other hyperedge. Now, one of the things we're going to be doing a lot of is, is working with very, very, very highly non-reduced hypergraphs. Okay, so we're going to be having hyperedges and subsets of hyperedges and subsets of hyperedges and so on and so forth. And that is going to be one of the things, one of the vehicles that's going to allow us to do efficient generalized leaf propagation on the hypergraph. Okay. So here's an example of uh, a hypergraph which is non-reduced in the bipartite graph representation, which is right here. Here's the guy, seven, hyperedge seven is a subset of six, and on the, on the right-hand side, seven has been removed, so therefore it's a reduced hypergraph. Okay, so what is the path in a hypergraph? You might wonder like what a path is. So a path is basically, um, I mean, in, in general, when you have a regular graph, first of all, like let's say here's a regular graph, right? Let's say here's, um, here's a set of edges. You can think of a path either as a set of vertices, or you can think of a path as the corresponding set of edges that connect those vertices. So it's not really precisely clear in a hypergraph how to, to represent a path as a set of vertices. But what we can do is ha say a path is represented using a set of edges. And so in fact, that's how we do it. We, we say a path from, let's say we have two vertices S and T. Okay, And we have a set of K edges. And these are the k edges down here. And the key thing is that s has to be, so the first edge has to contain s. Uh, the last edge has to contain t. And we have to make sure that along this sequence, this is an ordered sequence of edges, that successive edges are intersecting, meaning they have non-empty intersection. And that's exactly the criterion that defines a path in a regular graph too, because if we look at those red, red edges in the in the graph that down at the bottom that I drew, we see that each um, pair of, of edges along the path, successive edges along the path, intersect at the common at a common node. Okay, so a junction tree, as we know, is um, a tree of clusters of vertices of the graph where the tree satisfies the running intersection property. And we saw that there are a number of different ways of thinking of the running intersection property, including things like the induced subtree property. There's a missing Y there. Um, then a hypergraph, um, sorry, a hypertree. Anyone guess what a hypertree is? I mean, a hypertree, we've already sort of seen the definition. A hypertree would be a generalization of a tree. A hypertree is a graph, is a hypergraph that has something to do with a tree. And um, a junction tree, in fact, is a hypertree where the cliques are, constitute the edges in the, hyper, in the hypertree. Okay, so those, because every clique in a junction tree, it's a cluster of nodes, you can think of that as a hyper edge. Okay. But let's formally define a hypertree. Okay. So first of all, what is the vertex? Um, uh, sorry. What is a leaf uh, in a um, what is a leaf in in a in a hypergraph? So a leaf. So what is a leaf in a regular graph? Again, let's generalize this. So we have only one leaf, right? Uh, one property, one way of defining a leaf is that it lives in only one edge. 
right? There's only one edge where that leaf lives in, uh, whereas all these other vertices live in at least two edges, right? If we add more, then of course, you know, some of them live in three edges, um, or four edges even. Um, but um, we can actually use the same criterion to define a leaf in a hypergraph by saying a leaf in a hypergraph is a vertex that lives in only one edge. That's a leaf. Okay. So the hypergraph is called acyclic, and this is the definition we talked about last time. I want to make sure it's clear. The hypergraph is called acyclic if it's either empty, so it's an empty hypergraph, it's nothing, or it's, or it's the case that it contains a leaf, V, namely a, a node that lives in only one um, hyperedge, such that when you take the induced hypergraph, we basically take the hypergraph where that leaf node is removed, what that, that induced thing is still, hi is still acyclic. So bas basically what this means is that if you ever get to a point, if you ever get to a point where you, you do this recursive definition and there are no leaves, meaning all edges, sorry, all vertices live in at least two edges, then you know it's not an acyclic hypergraph. Now, this should be to you remarkably similar to the idea of a perfect elimination order. So if we think of the graph of the hypergraph, where every edge is a, is a clique in the graph of the hypergraph. Every hyperedge is a clique in the graph of the hypergraph. What does a leaf mean? So a leaf basically means that you're this clique. You're a vertex in this clique. Now, because you're in a clique, you're connected to every other vertex in that clique, right? But because you're also a leaf, you're not connected to anybody else outside of your clique. So that means if you eliminate that vertex, let's, let's, let me draw a picture. This will hopefully be a clique. And let's say here's another clique. Okay. And let's look at, let's consider this guy. So this is a graph of some hypergraph, which consists of two hyperedges, namely this one and this one. Okay, there's the graph of the hypergraph. We have a bunch of leaves. The one over here that I just um, marked up is a leaf. This guy is not a leaf. This one over here is not a leaf, right? Why? Because he lives in two hyperedges. But when we, uh, well the idea is that when we remove this, ed this vertex and all its incident edges, so you take the, that little edge, what we do is we have a sub clique, right? And that's possible to do. And we retain the acyclicity property as long as we can sort of rec recursively do that. Yep. So in, in normal uh, trees, we were guaranteed two, two leaf nodes. In hyper trees, are we guaranteed two generalized leaf nodes? What do you think? I think the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. That's right. Because we always know. I mean, in some sense, these leaves, what, what is the term that we used to refer in a regular graph to what we're calling here a leaf, a leaf node? You know what I remember? So this is basically identical, simplicial, yeah. It's simplicial in the graph of the hypergraph. And so since there's always <laughs> two simplicial nodes in the graph of the hypergraph, there always has to be at least two leaves in a hypertree. Or, a, sorry, in a cyclic hypergraph. Which, by the way, is also um, called a hypertree, right? Um, so a, a, a graph is a cyclic if it's conformal to a graph that's chordal. We saw that before. So it's it's a it's a cyclic if it's triangulated. And then, just finally, I mean, this is obvious at this point. So a, an a cyclic hypergraph is also uh, called a hypertree. So anytime you have a hypertree it's conformal to a triangulated graph. So that's what a hypertree is. So hypertrees are basically triangulated graphs, or at least are conformal to hyper, hyper to be precise, they're conformal to triangulated graphs. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is like, 
we talked about the idea of, of reduced, um, reduced hypergraphs and non-reduced hypergraphs. We can actually take the set of edges in a hypergraph, and we can sort of partially order them based on set inclusion. Like, for example, if one edge is a subset of another edge, then you can say that the subset of edge is less than or equal to the, to the bigger edge. And some edges are comparable, meaning that they might, there might be a chain of subsets, or there might be a whole you know, sub-lattice of subsets, all of which have a relationship well-defined between them. But there might also be incomparable hyperedges, like, for example, edges that are only partially intersecting, uh, or I should say, edges that have a proper symmetric difference aren't comparable. So let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about partially ordered sets. So a partially ordered set is a set with an ordering relationship. And so this is, again, what we talked a little bit about this last time. But the ordering relationship is um, called is contained in or is part of or is less than or equal to. I'll probably just, out of habit, just say is less than or equal to. But in the case of sets, what we really mean is it's it's a subset or equal to. So like, for example, if we have one set, if A, if A is equal to, if A is a set and it's a 1, 2, 3, 4, and B is a set which is equal to 1, 4, then we see that A is less than or equal to B. But on the other hand, if, if C is equal to, say, uh, 4, 5, then we can't say that, say, C uh, is, um, we can't say that, we can't compare them. They're not comparable. OK, so, um, so basically, it's a condition which is either true or false. And uh, we require the following conditions of, uh, for, for the post set to exist. So basically, for example, I mean, obviously, if you defined uh, this, this is just a binary operator on two arguments, which you could define any way you want. But in order to be a partially ordered set, it has to have these properties, namely the reflexivity property, the anti-symmetry property, and the transitivity property. The reflexivity property says that x is always less than or equal to x. Uh, anti-symmetry says that if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, if both of them are true, then we have to be talking about the same element of the set. And then transitivity says if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to z, then x is less than or equal to z. Um, right, so we can, we, we talked about this also, that if x is less than or equal to y but they're not equal, then x is strictly less than y, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, so like I said, for example, before, we need not have that x is less than or equal to y or y less than or equal to x be true. The idea is that these, these guys might not be comparable at all. But if it is the case that all elements are comparable to each other, then the partially ordered set is called totally ordered. And we essentially can line them up in a chain. Like if you have a chain of subsets, like take a subset and then take a set and then one subset and a subset of a subset and a subset of a subset of a subset and so on and so forth down to the empty set, those chain, that chain of subsets can be totally ordered. And if it's the case that a total order exists, then you can say that x is greater than y if it's not the case that x is less than equal to y. Um, so if if there is an element, so there exists only one element x which satisfies x is less than equal to y for all up, for all y. So the reason why, so I'm saying if there exists such an element, there exists only one. And why is it the case? Is suppose it's the case that x is less than or equal to y for all y. Suppose there are two of them, say x and z, and z is less than or equal to y for all y. Well, that would mean that z is less than or equal to x and x is less than or equal to z, which means that x is equal to z. They have to be identi identity. That's the anti-reflexivity uh, property from here. Anti-symmetry property, sorry. It's this property. So basically what that means is that there can only exist one element that's 
less than or equal to all the other elements. It doesn't mean that there has to be such an element, but so let me change this language to say there can exist. And if that element exists, that we could just sort of name it the zero element. And dually, by looking at greater than or equal to, we can say if there is such an element that exists that's greater than or equal to all other elements, there's, it's unique, and we can just call it one. And if we, if we have such an element, then, uh, then that basically very much relates to a lattice, what a lattice is. But we're not actually needing to go on to a full lattice. So the lattice is a partially ordered set with these additional uh, requirements. But since we're not requiring, we're going to be essentially defining partially ordered sets on elements that are hyperedges in a hypergraph. Okay. And we're not going to need it to be a lattice. We're not requiring it to be a lattice. Uh, but we are looking at it at the partially ordered set relationship. So this is the idea of a chain. So a set of elements x1 through xn is a chain if it's the case that this is true, which means that x is less than or equal to 2, x1 is less than or equal to 2, x2, x2 is less than or equal to x3, and so on and so forth. And it's normally the case that we think of a chain as distinct. I mean, although it's not necessarily the case, but usually when you say here's a chain of elements, they're usually distinct elements. This is the length of a chain. We're not going to use this. OK. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to represent a hypergraph by showing only their edges. OK? Because in some sense, you can, the, Im the implicit assumption is that, remember, each edge in a hypergraph is a set of vertices. And if we union together all of the edges, the implicit assumption is that we've got the set of vertices. So in other words, it's not the case. There's never the case that there's some vertex that's an, that's involved in no edge. Okay, it's a, it's in some sense a connected. It's not necessarily a connected graph, but there's never. It's it's like a hyperforest in some sense, in the sense that no no vertex is unedged, has no edge involved. And so here's the typical way that it's done. This is a um, this is actually the way that the book is doing it. These are actually figures from the book. And these are three graphical representations of hypergraphs showing only the hyperedges. So I think this is what was maybe a little confusing last time. Now the arrows are pointing to the subset relationships. Okay. So for example, we have one hyperedge, one, two, which points to both one and two. And the reason that that's happening is because one is a subset of the set one, two and 2 is a subset of the set 1, 2. In this case here, we have hyperedge 1, 2, 3 pointing to 2, 3, because 2, 3 is the subset of 1, 2, 3. And 2, 3, 4 is a superset of 2, 3. In this guy over here, we have, for example, like 1, 2, 4, 5 pointing to 2, 5 and to 4, 5, because both 2, 5 and 4, 5 are subsets of 1, 2, 4, 5. But note that we don't have a direct edge pointing to 5, even though 5 is a subset of 1, 2, 4, 5. Okay. So in general, what we say and what we do, and this is sort of the idea of a, of a Haas diagram, which is actually used to represent a partially ordered set, and it's also often used to represent a, a lattice, in which case the Haas diagram has a diamond shape. But in general, in a Haas diagram, you have an arrow from a set, say, to a subset. If there's no intervening or intermediary set that lives between them, so like for example, if I have the set uh, one, two, three, and the set one, two, and the set one, I would point an arrow this way and this way, but I wouldn't put that arrow there. The reason why is because there's this intervening set, 1, 2, that lives between 1, 2, 3, and 1. If, on the other hand, this set didn't exist in uh, the partially ordered set, right? remember, so this might also be a little bit confusing because it's a partially ordered set where the elements are sets themselves. And we're ordering the set of sets based on set inclusion. So 
the set 1, 2, if the set 1, 2 doesn't exist, then there can be an arrow between the set 1, 2, 3 and the set 1. Is that, is that confusing to anybody? Or is that totally 100%? Okay, so um, getting back to the idea of a reduced one, which one of these hypergraphs are reduced or in, are, have a reduced representation? Any of them? None of them, right? None of them. So as, as I said, we're going to be dealing with hypergraphs in, that are very, very highly non-reduced. In fact, look at the right one. It's horrendously, wonderfully non-reduced. Right? All of this stuff in the middle would have to be removed. And this guy, this would have to be removed, and this one, this would have to be removed. Right? So we're not, these are non-reduced hypergraphs. Okay? Here's the bipartite graph representation of this hypergraph. This actually corresponds to a four cycle, believe it or not. Um, the four cycle would be one, two, three, four, I think. One, two, two, three, and three, four, right? So make sure I got the numbers right. And um, I think the hypergraph, is the bipartite graph representation of this pretty clear? So we have three representations of the same thing. Um, um, this one actually is a true, is a true hypergraph, right? So like for example, we this is one that so so this is one that actually is representable I using the regular graph, right? Because the regular graph is exact because every hyperedge has got two nodes. But one one of the things I should mention though that you can't really do, and the reason why we're going to be using this is that we're going to be doing message passing on this thing. Okay. So um, now, if we were to do belief this loopy belief propagation, we know that we pass, pass messages from edges to vertices and edges to vertices. So it, from this perspective, loopy belief propagation makes sense and is actually giving us what everything that we would potentially want to do on this kind of graph because we're dealing with either the singleton nodes, which are these middle guys here in loopy belief propagation, or the pairwise nodes, which are these outer ones here. Right? And so we've got the singleton nodes here, 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 and here in the hypergraph and the pairwise nodes here, here, and here, and here. Okay. On the other hand, this graph, if we were to, if we, we were to write this graph, it's still, it's still um, four nodes. One, two, three, and two, three, four. So we don't really know what the actual strategy for doing message passing is. Like, do we do Libby belief propagation going just from edges to, to sort of regular graph edges, which are pairs of vertices down to singleton nodes. What this graph is saying, when we're going to look at this graph, let's zoom in a little bit, we might pass, we might have three tables involved in our data structure that we're trying to solve inference in. One table might be a three-dimensional one, another one might be a three-dimensional one. Well, one, one is three-dimensional. The other one is also three-dimensional. The other one is two-dimensional. And we might pass messages between various different three-dimensional ones. And now this, of course, is a triangulated graph. And this is exactly what a junction tree algorithm would do. Right? So here, we've just essentially used a hypergraph representation of a junction tree. But this one is a little bit more interesting. I'm not going to draw the graph for here. Uh, but what I will do is draw the, the cliques. You could think of this as one, um, one, two, four, five, which is one clique, and that's connected to four, um, five, seven, eight, and it's also connected to two, three, five, six. So if we were to devise a, a message passing scheme for this hypergraph, we would be doing something not exactly the same as a junction tree. We would, for example, might be, we might pass messages from, from this clique down to these guys, and these ones down to these guys, and from that guy up to here, and these guys maybe up to here, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now in this particular case, 
you might think, well, why would we bother? Because if we just look at the junction tree and the complexity is going to be r to the fourth, because the clique size is r to the fourth, how is this going to actually benefit us? So in general, it, it, this, this is not an instance where the actual underlying complexity, r to the fourth, is going to be improved, because as soon as we pass any message... This, so, by the way, it should be, I think, pretty clear what a message like, would, like, what a message like this would be. This would be something like we have some function. We'd sum out, say, uh, let's use a little bit smaller of a pen. We'd sum out maybe x1, x2. We'd have some function of x1, x2, x3. So x1, x2, x4, x5. And we'd get some other function, which is just x4 and x5. And that guy, that result, would be then maybe multiplied in. So it's like a form of marginalization, very much like what we saw in the case of a message. In the case of a message, we had mu from one node to another node, where the nodes basically were such that we marginalize out the, the, the node that we're sending a message from. Here, what we're doing is we're sending out a message from one cluster to another cluster, where we're marginalizing out the variables that are not in the, the hyper edge that we're sending a message to, which in this case is 4, 5. And then similarly, when we want to send a message back from a subset to a larger one, what do you think we would do? We would just multiply it in, right? just, which is exactly what happens. Once we get these messages, we just multiply them in. Right? Because it's a function, like any function of 4, 5 can be multiplied into a function that's a function of one, x1, x2, x4, x5, in the exact same analogous way. OK, so we've got this hypergraph representation here, and we've got the bipartite graph representation. So is everybody clear on how this represents a bipartite graph, a non-reduced non hypergraph? OK. So from the perspective of sending messages from hyperedges, we don't even need to care about the original nodes. Maybe it's the case that we have a hyperedge which consists of only one node, like 5, like this guy right here. That's only a one vertex hyperedge. So, um, okay, so here they are again. And I think I've already said this. So this is, this is the property that we say that A points to B if it's the case that uh, B is less than or equal to A and there does not exist a C between B and A. This is like a hash diagram. Usually in a hash diagram, you, have, you always have the arrows pointing down. But in these... Uh, Hass-like diagrams of these partially ordered sets were not having the arrows pointing down. But that's okay. We'll forgive them. Right. So, okay, I think I've already said this. So any, any, any other questions? Okay, so I, I want to um, talk a little bit about inclusion-exclusion because actually we're, we're, we're falling way behind. So I'm going to try to speed up. Raise your hand if this is like Again, very clear. So maybe I should speed up a little bit. So the idea of inclusion exclusion is the idea is that, is that we have um, a ground set U of sets. This is th we're going to relate this to what we've just been talking about. So we have a, a ground set U, and we have two subsets, A and B of U. And we may express the size of A intersect B as, which is this, as the size of A plus the size of B minus the size of the intersection. And we also may, for example, if we have three subsets, A, B, and C, we can express the size of the union as first including the size of each of the sets, A and B and C, then excluding the size of the pairwise intersections, and then including back in the size of the three-way intersection. And you can get this just by looking at, at, this, at these diagrams down here, right? Because if you want the size of the union, A and B, then you basically need to, you add this, and you add this, but then this stuff here has been double counted, so you need to subtract it off. And a very similar thing happens here, where you add C, you add, um, add C, you add A, and you add B, 
So now that very, very middle section you've counted three times. So now you subtract off this pair, subtract off this pair, and subtract off this pair. So now this middle section is counted negative one times. And so now you need to add it back in, which is this middle section right here. And this generalizes to multiple sets. So the general idea of inclusion-exclusion is essentially also sometimes called the method of the sieve. And the basic idea is, is first you, you, you want to measure some quantity. And this happens over and over again. In, this, in the case above on, uh, here, we're just measuring the size of a set, size of a union of a set. So we want to measure some quantity. And what we do is we first add in some quantities, which overshoots the measure. Then we subtract out some more quantities, which then undershoots. And then you add back in some more quantities again, and you overshoot again. And so you subtract off some more quantities and undershoot. And you just keep doing this, adding and subtracting and adding and subtracting, overshooting and undershooting and overshooting and undershooting. But each amount of overshoot and undershoot decreases until eventually you get to the point where at last you are at convergence or something, where you, you've, you've got the right answer. Now, adding doesn't necessarily mean adding. Adding could be multiplying, or adding could be doing anything like in a, maybe a semi-ring or something. Uh, but the point is, in this particular case, what we're going to be talking about is, is either adding, or if, if these things that we're adding are log probabilities, what we're really doing is multiplying and dividing the probabilities. Like multiplying in some stuff, and then dividing by some stuff, and multiplying to overshoot again, and dividing by undershooting, and so on and so forth. And this is going to be uh, something that gives us a really nice way of, of expressing entropic quantities and probability distributions. So in particular, the entropy has an inclusion-exclusion inclusion property as well. For example, the entropy of a pairwise, uh, of a pair of random variables is equal to the entropy of x and the entropy of y minus the mutual information. The entropy of a triple is equal to the entropies of the corresponding random variables minus the pairwise mutual informations plus the final correction, which is the what's called the information amongst the three random variables, x, y, and z, which is a well-defined thing. In fact, there's a whole theory on information measures. And if you look, Jung has a really nice book on information theory, which has is a long chapter or two about in inclusion-exclusion properties of information measures. Um, the general inclusion exclusion property for some set measure, so we have some set measure, is the following. Like, if you want, you can just think of mu as the size of x. Mu of x is the size of x. So we can measure the size of the intersection of n sets, which is like an inclusion of the singletons, the removal, the exclusion of the pairs, the re inclusion of the triples, and so on and so forth, until at last you either remove or add the intersection, sorry, the union of, of everybody. Now, whether or not negative 1 to the n minus 1 is plus 1 or minus 1 depends on the number of items n. It depends on the odd or the even condition of n. And there's also a dual form of inclusion-exclusion, where instead of measuring the intersection of the set of items, we want to measure the union of the set of items, where, again, we include and we exclude and we include and, again, keep doing this until eventually we get to the last one, which is either an include or an exclude step, depending on the odd or the evenness of n. And here's sort of a nice short way of writing these things, where we sum out sum for all k is equal to 1 to n, and then we include or exclude depending on um, you know, the, si the, the, uh, the oddness or the evenness of k. And then what we include or exclude is basically the sum of all, in some sense, unions of size, uh, where the, the number of indices is of size k. That's all this notation really means. So like, for example, this stuff down here basically is saying um, we're, we're, we're taking the set of indices i1 through ik, so there's k indices. That means that we're unioning always together k sets, and we're basically choosing um, all sets of indices of si where the sets of set of indices are size k, where the indices come from the integers ranging from 1 through n. And here's the dual form down here. <coughs> 
Yeah, question. Uh, I have a general question. Uh, can this UV any set function? It's a, it's, mu is sort of a, is a measure. So it has to have the properties of a measure. And, the, and I, I don't, we don't have to go into that right now. But basically, you could think of it as uh, something, like the one that we're talking about is just the cardinality of the sets. But um, it can be more general than this as well. So. Yep. So oh, yeah. Um, it seems to be inherently combinatorial, whereas if you just do a sequence of things, where like you just go one set and like do an intersection with the second set and so on, you might just have one linear class to get exactly the same quantity. You might, but this this is something I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I mean, like. Yes, that's true. And that is just a linear kind of a thing, whereas this seems to be common Yes, that's true. But this actually allows you to prove very, very interesting theorems mathematically. And this, this shows up a lot. Um, but I mean, it, it, the idea is, for example, you want to go from one type of function to another type of function. And this is, a, this is an example of what we're about to see, which is the Mobius inversion lemma. Okay. So it's not always the case that we can evaluate one function just by itself. We, might, we don't, might only have access to this other set of functions. And what are these two functions that we have access to is related by the Mobius inversion. So here's, here's the Mobius inversion lemma and inclusion and how, and how it relates to inclusion and exclusion. In fact, um, the idea is the following. You define two functions, omega, omega here, and epsilon. Um, and um, these are defined on subsets of, of this index set V. So for any A, which is a subset of V, then the above inclusion exclusion principle turns out to be just one instance of this more general property, which is the Mobius inversion lemma, which is something we're going to prove, hopefully, if we have time, namely that the below equations imply each other. So in other words, if, if it's the case that you have this relationship between epsilon and omega, then for I namely for any A, epsilon of A is equal to you know, this sum over the subsets, then it's also the case that you have this relationship, which is like the dual relationship. Now this is something that's really important uh, in graphical models, and it's, used, it's, prob it's very important in, in all aspects of combinatorics, enumer enumerative combinatorics, where this relationship, this general relationship, the Mobius inversion comes up very, very often. And in fact, we use it in graphical models to prove the Hammersley-Clifford theorem. That, uh, yep. I, 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 I imagine that the, the measure property used in the inclusion exclusion principle was just the countable additivity of the measure. Uh, but here you also require it to be positive, so is it really a generalization? Um, it, it's, it is a generalization. It, these actually don't need to be positive. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just saying, in fact, let's get rid of this, this positive st stuff. So you won't, you're right, you only need the counter of additivity. So I think in, I hopefully I don't have this typo in a minute. Hold on one second. Yeah, so here, it's in, a, in the Abelian group. So we don't need to, this is just an, an example to sort of generalize step by step. But you're right, we don't need the positivity necessarily. Um, but what I want to do is I want to, um, so for, for I want to state the Hamlet-Lee Clifford theorem without proof, but I just want to state why it's important. We didn't actually prove it in this class, but it's something that actually relates back to the Markov properties that we talked about at the beginning of the class um, very briefly. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the Mervis inversion to come up with an expression, an alternate expression for the entropy which is again, you know, the dual of the log partition function, the negative dual of the log partition function, in terms of the hypergraphs on, or, or in terms of partially ordered sets on a hypergraph. Okay, so here's the Hammersley Clifford theorem. Just, I want to state what this is, because you should be aware of it. So we're defining F plus to be a family of positive distributions, namely those distributions that are strictly greater than or equal to zero then what the Hammersley-Clifford theorem says in all of its glory 
is that the intersection of the positive distributions and all distributions that factorize with respect to a graph using the factorization property, namely that the probability distribution is factored with respect to the cliques of the graph, is exactly the same as the intersection of all of the positive distributions with the family of probability distributions that factorize with respect to the pairwise Markov property. Um, this, this is something we actually just ignore this bit because we didn't talk about this. Just ignore that bit for a minute, I mean for now. So this thing here is basically the family of distributions we've been talking about. The pairwise Markov property is something that I might have mentioned once or twice, but it actually is something you should be aware of about. It basically says that if you've got a graph, you can define a family via the pairwise Markov property, which says that you are a member of the family if it's the case, with respect to a graph, if it's the case that whenever um, there's a missing edge between two vertices u and v, that there's a conditional independent statement, namely that x of u is independent of x of v, given all of the remaining variables in the graph. So missing edges require conditional independence. So any distribution that obeys the pairwise Markov property is in this family of distributions that has this independent statement whenever there's a missing edge. And what the Hammersley Clifford's theorem says really is that, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's always the case that the family of distributions defined based on the factorization property is a subset of the family of distributions defined with respect to the pairwise Markov property. So in other words, if you are a distribution that factorizes with respect to the graph in terms of the cliques of the graph, then it's also the case that whenever there's an edge missing, you are a distribution that states that those two vertices are independent given the remaining the vertices in the graph. Because that's what that first thing says. And what the Hammersley-Clifford theorem says is the opposite. It says basically that if, you are a dis if you're positive and if you're a distribution that obeys the pairwise Markov property, then you factorize with respect to the graph. And so this is something that, for example, is useful in the case of Gaussians. That you know, if you look at the inverse covariance matrix, Gaussians are positive. The in inverse covariance matrix is such that the zeros in the inverse covariance matrix correspond to the missing edges in the graph, for which that Gaussian factors with respect to. Okay. And to prove this, what's proven, this bit, to prove this thing, you need the Mobius inversion lemma. So it's. Um, it's not just a trivial, combinatorially difficult way of evaluating set intersection. Okay, it's, a, it's a very powerful theorem. <coughs> so here's the Mobius inversion lemma generally. So we're defining um, epsilon and, and omega to be functions defined on subsets of V and taking values in an abelian group, which basically it's not just um, positive numbers. It's basically any set that has uh, closure, and it's associative, it has an um, identity, an operator identity, and an inverse. And it's commutative. And the real numbers are just one example, and, and not necessarily the positive real numbers. <coughs> so the idea of the Mervis inversion lemma is, th is that these things imply each other. So if you have one, you've got the other. So how do we prove it? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with this guy. We're going to plug this into here. And this is mainly, this here is really this expression here. And what we're going to do, after we plug that into there, we're going to get back that. That's the strategy. <coughs> so we're starting again with <coughs> this guy here. There's the st where we're starting, which is this. And we're plugging in the right-hand side for omega of b, which is this part. Um, so just what's happening here is that, um, um, so it's a function of b. So you can see that in this case, we're summing for all b, which is a subset of a, and this is a subset of of b of c, which is a subset of b. Okay, so you can think of a over here, and we have all of these subsets here, and we have all these still subsets here. So we might as well just, for example, say, well, c ranges between 
C, rate, C is the subset of A, but then B is going to be something that ranges between C and A. Okay? And that's essentially what, uh, what the terms we've got here. That's what C is, right? Because we know that, um, that B is between C and A. And so that's all we're expressing here, where C is the lower part and A is the upper part. And so we've got the same expression there. But now what we do is we have an outer sum which is just in terms of C. So we can bring out this term. And we have this inner term. But when we look at B, which is a subset of A but not a subset of C, we can see that that's identical to, to sets A, which are subsets of A except for C. Because we're never, in some sense, less than less than um, C because of this part over here. But then any subset, we're always taking out C. So it, basically, we might as well just range over A except for C and then raise negative 1 to the, eight, to the size of H power. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this expression. And for any set D, rather than, you know, so in this case, D is um, A except for C. So if you look at any set D here, if we look at this expression here, um, well, we can just say it's the sum for i is equal to 0 to the size of D, and then the number of times that we, uh, number of ways of choosing i from D. So these are all of the things that are of size i, and then it's negative 1 to the i. All right. Uh, we can express, we can multiply that whole quantity by 1, by a, a sort of interesting form of 1, which is 1 to the d minus i. But this suddenly now becomes the binomial expansion of 1 minus 1 to the dth power. And 1 minus 1 to the dth power is equal to 1 if um, d is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. So in other words, this whole expression down here is equal to 1 if d, which is equal to a minus c, is uh, empty, which only happens when a is equal to c. And otherwise, it's 0. So this whole expression here, this whole expression down here, becomes very, very simple. And we've got this expression where we have the sum for c less than or equal to a of epsilon c of an indicator of a being equal to c, which is this thing. But that basically kills off all of the terms in the sum and gives us epsilon of a which basically proves what we wanted to prove. OK, so the other direction is almost identical. It's just, uh, and again, manipulations of sets and sums. So it turns out that there is a Mobius inversion lemma for a partially ordered sets. So, so if P is a partially ordered set with a binary relationship, we can define a zeta function, which is just an indicator of G being less than or equal to H. So it's basically, it's a function zeta of g and h, which, is, which indicates the binary relationship. And then the, the Mobius function, by the way, I should mention that if, if you look at this in terms of matrix multiply, Mobius inversion is basically just a trivial consequence of matrix multiply and, and a matrix having an, an inverse. So it's really just matrix inverse for a particular matrix multiply, which is non-singular. And so the, you can think of this as a, as a zeta function, and you can think of this as a matrix, and it has an inverse, a multiplicative inverse, which is given by omega. And the way to define this inverse is by saying that it's equal to 1 for all, uh, for, for all guys in the, in, the, in the set when you evaluate it on itself. So omega of g, comma g is 1. It's equal to 0. Whenever it's the case that h is not less than or equal to g. So that basically means that if h is greater than g or if they're not comparable, then it's equal to 0. And then lastly, we can define it recursively such that if we've, um, uh, actually, I have a nice, let me just do a picture of this here. So um, <coughs> <coughs> think of this as this is our partially ordered set, right? And um, <coughs> here's uh, G, 
And all this stuff down here These are all the elements which are less than or equal to g. And any h that's not less than or equal to g is everything else up here. So this is h. All those elements. And each, each point in here is one of these elements. So that would be like one possible h. So everything in the yellow guy. <coughs> and then similarly, we can also use a similar picture to re represent this guy, where um, you know we have this is this would be in the case of a lattice. It's not generally a lattice. So I guess officially, I should draw this as like a truncated diamond. So if it's not a lattice, the diamond is truncated. Maybe we've got um, um, G and H here. And this is F. F lives in, is a point in there. And so it's basically all F, which is greater than G, greater than or equal to G, but strictly less than F. So I guess officially, we would probably want to write this as maybe an open open guy at the top. So it's basically saying, assuming that f is defined, assuming that omega is defined for all g and h within this yellow region down here, this yellow region, we can define it for g and f. Sorry, we can define it for g and h. By summing over everybody in this diamond, essentially, this sums over everybody in, in this region here, but not including h, because that's not defined. That's the thing that we're defining to define it for g and h. Now, it's actually <coughs> possible to show that um, these guys are multiplicative inverses to, in, on each other. <coughs> Just this part right here. The reason why that holds, I mean, there's a very simple picture that shows this, <coughs> where if you look at these points here in this right hand side sum, um, <coughs> if we have one point here, in other words, if, if it's the case that G and H are the same, then it's going to have value 1. Okay. If, on the other hand, if, if g is here and h is here, this is going to have value 1. This is going to be negative 1. This is going to be negative 1. And this is value 1. And so when you do, when you sum up everything in this range, namely this bit here over this little diamond, we're going to do 1 plus 1 minus 1 minus 1, which is equal to 0. So therefore, this is we get this Dirac or this Kronecker delta function down here, which is basically one only when g is equal to h, which is essentially a, a, the same as a diagonal matrix where we have ones along the diagonal. And so basically, if you think of this as matrix multiply, it's just basically multiplying a matrix by its inverse. So this is the Mobius inversion lemma on partially ordered sets. And here's the actual official form. And we've sort of already done that. This is sort of the form. So what this is going to do now is give us an ability to all all this work that we've we're doing. And then in the next ten minutes we have to finish the Kikuchi method. So we've got um, marginals that factor with respect to the hypergraph. So in other words, we've got mu sub h for all h and e, right? So e is now a hypergraph, or e is, e is are the edges of a hypergraph. These are hyperedges, <coughs> and we can define these quantities by taking the log of these marginals using the Mobius inversion lemma, we can define a new function, log of um, phi uh, sub h. 
And then from the Mobius inversion lemma, we get an expression of the marginals in terms of uh, sums over, you know, again, based on the par partially ordered set, the sums of, of this thing. So this is actually really, really important. Basically, it says that you, if you have, you define a hypergraph, okay? You've got these hyperedges. You've got marginals over the hyperedges. The marginals over the hyperedges are the things that we want. But um, you can relate the marginals over the hyperedges to some other function, this log of phi for all of the um, hyperedges using this inversion lemma. And this will allow us, believe it or not, to write the entropy in a whole bunch of new, a uh, uh, nice way. And moreover, it also allows us to write the actual probability distribution. If we actually take the phi functions and we multiply it over all of the hyperedges, we get back exactly the expression of the joint distribution. So this might look very unfamiliar with you, but in, in fact, equation 15.32 is exactly what we've already seen in the case for one trees. If we've got a one tree, then we have hyperedges consisting of pairs of vertices, and also a hyperedge consists of the individual nodes, right? Because in, in the hypertree representation of a tree, we've got a hyperedge for each node and for each edge. And so that means that here we're actually multiplying over, in equation 15.32, we're multiplying over both node fees and edge fees. So what is that going to look like? We're going to essentially have node fees, which are basically individual marginals, and edge fees, which are these ratios of the mar pairwise marginals to the singleton marginals, which gives us back this expression for the distribution on a tree that we've seen before early in the class. Now imagine doing this for a hypergraph. This, you know, like what, what we did before, so remember what we did, we took equation 15.34, and we said, okay, we can easily compute the entropy of this thing in this form when it's the tree. We just take the expected value of the log of, of that stuff, right? And that basically gives us the sums and differences of entropies, or the sums and differences of mutual informations, each of which only involves a pair. And then we can say we can take we can generalize that expression by saying instead of a set of edges here of a of a tree, we can take all edges in the graph. And that's no longer the entropy, but it's something that maybe is easily to compute, and we can use it as uh, the the du approximate for the dual. But now what we're going to do is use this more general expression, namely this guy, in terms of the Mobius inversion transformation of the marginals. And we're going to get an expression which you might expect in the case of a hypertree is exactly the junction tree representation of the probability distribution, namely the product of the clique marginals divided by the separator marginals. But then when it's not a hypertree, when it's just a hypergraph, we get some other expression, which again is sort of an approximate entropy function, which again, if it's the case that we're not forcing the cliques to be too big by being a junction tree cover, is going to be comp computationally tractable. So that's basically the idea. So how do we do this for this hypergraph that we've been seeing? So we have this edge set um, here. And if we write this, if we use equation 5.31, we get, you know, right away, we're just going to get that this phi function is equal to mu for the pairwise guys, sorry, for the, for the singletons, for each s. For these pairwise ones, it's equal to the ratio of the means. So like, for example, 2, 5, we, though it's actually, it, it, this might sound like it's dip more difficult than it is, but basically you just go back to this expression here. And you say, okay, h is a pair 2, 5. Okay, so then basically we're saying that log of mu 2, 5 is equal to log of phi 2, 5 plus log of mu 2, which are basically all g's which are less than h. And the, in that hypergraph, the only g which is less than h when h is 2, 5 is what? We go back to the hypergraph, we check, partially ordered set. 5. So therefore we get this expression here. And similarly, we just we, we do the same thing but for this uh, 
set of four variables, and we recursively do this, and we get this expression for v. And in fact, we get the whole expression, the whole expression for the joint distribution in this form here. And in fact, if we do the whole thing, when, once we expand everything out and eliminate the redundancies, we in fact get the uh, junction tree representation, product of cleaves divided by product of, of separators, of marginals. But you know, this is a triangulated graph. Um, there are also ways in which you can express the entropy function. So here's the entropy function, and here's this multi-information function, which basically is, again, um, something, because here it's something that can be exp computationally evaluated by using the Möbius inversion expression for phi inside of there. So like, for example, in the case of that hypergraph, we've got the multi-information for singletons is the negative entropy, and for pairs is equal to this difference of entropies. And if it's the regular tree, then we get that for any pairs, it's equal to the standard expression for the mutual information. But it's not going to be a standard mutual information when it's not a tree. But it's still going to be computationally tractable. Um, so you get then this, this sort of expression of <coughs> the uh, hypergraph entropy by summing over all edges in the tree. This is our approximation. And I'm not going to prove this, but it, it turns out that you can actually represent the uh, multi-information function in this form, which actually is, uh, turns out to be very easy to evaluate. It's basically, again, looking at all, um, summing over all f's, which are less than or equal to h in the hypergraph representation of, of the post set, partially ordered set. And this c function, this is like an overcounting measure. It's very much analogous to the shattering coefficient or the degree in a regular graph. In fact, it's exactly equal to 1 minus the degree in the regular graph. And so we get this really nice, easy to evaluate, easy from the perspective of being no more than exponential in the largest hyperedge expression of the entropy. And so we have an expression of, uh, of the actual distribution. Um, <coughs> and um, we can also use the hyper, in, in the case of a hypertree, we have these marginals that we need. For example, like we need every hyperedge. If it was a marginal, it would sum to one. We're not saying it's real marginals anymore. Just like in the case of we saw pseudo marginals, we at least need to be the case if it, if it was a marginal. A necessary condition is that the marginals themselves need to sum to one, and we need to have um, agreement amongst um, these elements in the partially ordered set. So, like if g is less than or equal to h, then it must be the case that if we marginalize out of h everything that's not in g, we have agreement. So we have sort of hypertree agreement. And with that hypertree agreement set of um, hypertree marginal agreement, we can actually define a polytope, which is analogous to the tree polytope that we saw in the case of a tree. But now what we're doing is we're asking for more agreement, but we're only asking for agreement with respect to hyperedges that are subsets of, of other hyperedges. And we have this generalized hypergraph entropy, and we have and this counting overcounting number, and I'm trying to get to the, the crux of the matter. So basically, that's what finally gives us the Kikuchi approximation. Wow. OK, we're running out of time again. If it's the case that this is a graph, we've got exactly the beta free energy, the, be the beta entropy, I mean, or sorry, the beta approximation. And if it's a, hyper if it's a junction tree, then it's exact. Because if, it's, if, it's, if the hypergraph is a junction tree covered of the original thing, then we've made no approximation at all. We've got the exact polytope and the exact entropy. But in general, we don't, right? Like, for example, you might take a graph like this, and you might cluster the, this is the graph on the left, and you might cluster them. So like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 would be one cluster. And you can imagine, like in this particular graph, by the way, I should say that there's no computational savings because the complexity is still r to the fourth. <coughs> 
But imagine now like a, a, a very a, a big grid graph, right? So it, big grid graphs, you could define clusters on these four cycles. And you could then be sending messages in this hypergraph representation of this four cycle. And you would actually get something whose complexity is exponential in no more than the number of guys in the biggest cluster, which is four. Which other, where otherwise, if you had a big grid structure, the complexity would be exponential in the square root of n. So it would be growing with n, whereas here the complexity, the exponential growth is, is only in the size of the biggest cluster, which is going to be 4. Now that's better, it's more expensive than the pairwise uh, complexity, which would be r squared, if it was the case they were doing loopy belief propagation. But we're doing this generalized loopy belief propagation by passing messages on this hypergraph. Each message might cost r to the fourth. So, so I, like, I, I guess, can, can you imagine like, if we took a, a grid graph that looked like this? How, how this hypergraph would generalize to that? We just essentially instantiate this for each one of these. So that's, that's the same one, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. This one, say. We would do, we, we're sort of doing one thing here. And we would do the same exact thing here, and the same thing here, and the same thing there. And we glue these, we make one large hypergraph. I'll do a figure for this on Monday's lecture. Obviously, we're running out of time. I'm surprised we're not being kicked out of class. Anyway, I will see you on Monday. Thank you very much.